Hello everyone, welcome to our chapter 14 lecture series for your textbook, Give Me Liberty by Dr. Eric Foner. This chapter is entitled, A New Birth of Freedom, The Civil War, 1861 to 1865. This first section is entitled, The First Modern War. The focus question for this section is, why is the Civil War considered the first modern war? The American Civil War has often been called the first modern war by many historians. This was the first war in history where mass armies with industrial weapons fought and incurred astronomical numbers of casualties. When we compare the Union and the Confederacy at the outset of this war, each side had distinct advantages and disadvantages. The Union by far had a larger population, so a greater access to overall manpower. Due to the industrial development that had taken place in the North over the previous decades, the North, the Union, far outstripped the Confederates in manufacturing, in railroad road mileage, and financial resources. But the Union had to invade and conquer a fiercely motivated enemy, something that is very difficult to do under any sorts of military circumstances. Also, the Union had few recruits with previous military service and previous experience in warfare. Most of the experience and skilled military men, like Robert E. Lee, sided with the Confederacy in this war. The chart you see on this slide here illustrates the distinct advantages the Union had when it came to access to resources for the war. As you can see in population, the Union had about 22 million versus about 9 million in the Confederacy, of which 3.5 million of that 9 million were slaves and not available to fight directly in the war, at least not at first. As far as factories, which indicates industrial capacity, the Union had about 110,000 versus the Confederacy's 18,000. The value of the goods produced by the economies, the Union had about a 1.5 billion evaluation, uh, or valuation, excuse me, to their overall economic output versus about 155 million for the Confederacy. As far as railroad mining, Mileage, uh, as a percentage of the total mileage in the entire United States, Union and Confederacy, 70% of that railroad mileage was in the North, which greatly allowed the Union advantage when it came to moving men and resources around. As far as textiles, there was a 17 to 1 ratio when it came to cotton cloth and woolen goods. For firearms, there was a 32 to 1 ratio with the Union advantage in the availability of firearms. And pig iron, the raw material used to make things like cannon, the uh, Union had a advantage of a 20 to 1 ratio in that resource there. All in all, the Union's access to resources was far greater, which would prove to be a deciding factor ultimately in the war itself. By the time of the 1860s, the technology of war had far outstripped the ability of military commanders to accommodate and assimilate these new technologies into their overall tactics and strategies, something that would prove uh, near disastrous, especially in the early stages of the war. Railroads had greatly increased the ability uh, to move troops and supplies quickly throughout the theaters of war. Ironclad ships were developed, which greatly enhanced the capabilities of the navies of both sides of the conflict. The telegraph 
allow for much quicker battlefield communications between commanders and between those commanders, commanders and their higher ups in the government. There was a revolution in arms manufacturing. The modern rifle had been developed, and this allowed for far greater range and accuracy in firearms, which of course made them much more deadly. The Civil War also saw the first real instances of elaborate trench setups and trench warfare, which also greatly increased the lethality in this war. Together, rifles, other technological advances and trenches produced 750,000 casualties between both sides before the war was over, an astronomical number that had heretofore been unseen in military history. Public opinion and morale is crucial to the successful prosecution of any war, and of course this was no exception in the Civil War. Both sides, the Union and Confederacy, employed vast modern propaganda efforts to mobilize public opinion surrounding the war. Both sides engaged in rhetoric meant to demonize their opponent and increase the public support for the war. War correspondents were embedded directly with the armies and sent battlefield reports usually via telegraph directly to their publishers who then published these reports and spread them throughout the country. Photography had advanced greatly by this time and captured shocking images of the realities of war for really the first time in modern history, something that the public was not quite ready for, and this also served to both diminish at times and increase morale depending on the nature and the victims uh, illustrated in these photographs. At the outset of the war, Lincoln insisted that the war was not about slavery, particularly about the elimination of slavery, but instead about preserving the Union itself. Lincoln, at this early stage, still hoped to possibly negotiate peace and reconciliation with the succeeded southern states. And many Northerners were reluctant to fight a war that they were told was over slavery, which was another reason why Lincoln was very careful to couch his rhetoric surrounding the war as diminishing the role and influence of slavery on the war itself and increasing this idea that the war was a fundamentally about preserving the Union itself. At the outset of the war, both sides naively assumed that the war would be short and sweet, full of glory for all involved. They thought that the enemy would be easily defeated and the boys would be home in time to celebrate Christmas with their families. This, of course, proved to be far from the truth. Each side tried to maximize its advantages in the early stages. The Confederacy adopted a defensive strategy under leading commander General Robert E. Lee. Essentially, all the South had to do was hold out long enough for the North to exhaust its resources and manpower and give up in its efforts to bring the South back to heel, if you will. The North attempted to maximize its population strength and advantages and industrial power. Lincoln's early generals, however, faced significant challenges. Their naivete about the 
technological advances and how that would affect tactics and strategies produce a narrowness of military vision and that coupled with untrained troops left the Union floundering in the early stages of the war. And they began their efforts by attempting to go straight for the heart of the Confederacy itself and recapture Richmond, which was a, a task that proved to be much more difficult than they had assumed at the beginning. The Union did devise an all-encompassing grand strategy for the war at the very beginning. General Winfield Scott, who was the commanding officer in the successful Mexican War, devised a plan that he called the Anaconda Plan. And this plan essentially was to surround the Confederacy and strangle it from receiving supplies and support, which would gradually whittle away the Confederacy's ability to keep the war going. This Anaconda plan consisted of a naval blockade of the coast, an attempt to control all the major rivers and waterways, still a very important way to transport troops and supplies, and of course a multi-pronged land invasion of the South itself. This plan was resisted at first by other northern military leaders, but as the war dragged on and became more and more apparent that this was not going to be the quick and easy victory that either side assumed would take place, the North did gradually adopt Scott's Anaconda plan, and it proved to be pretty successful in the long run. The first Battle of Bull Run on July 21, 1861 was the first significant engagement of the Civil War. And just to provide an example of the laissez-faire sort of attitudes that most of the public took at the outset of this war, residents of Washington, D.C., which was near where this first battle took place, actually picnicked on the high ground above the battlefield hoping to witness the battle. It was all going to be a, a good day's fun to many of the civilians who participated in this. However, the fierce and bloody fighting was more than anyone expected. Both sides stood in lined ranks as had been standard military practice up until that time. But of course, they did not take into, the, into account the significant increase in lethality that weapons like the rifled musket would have on warfare. And as these men lined up in straight lines uh, in the ranks of battle and fired at near point blank range, blank range at each other, the casualties mounted exponentially, nearly right off the bat, and the deadly nature of all this led most of those picnicking residents on the high ground above the battle to flee in panic once they witnessed what was actually going on. The South, the Confederacy, was able to achieve victory in this first battle, which in itself helped to diminish Union morale and also decrease this idea that this war was going to be short and sweet. After their de the Union defeat and the chaotic retreat of Union soldiers, General George McClellan assumed command of the Union armies, and as a result, months of military inactivity followed. McClellan was reluctant to commit his troops to battle, and as a Democrat, McClellan hoped for negotiation and compromise, and therefore was very hesitant to engage, especially in the sorts of large-scale battles like the Battle of Bull Run that had proved so disastrous for the Union at the beginning. <laughs> 
In the early stages of the war, there were two distinct theaters, one in the East and one in the West, with the Eastern theater primarily taking place within the state of Virginia itself. Now, the war in the East at the beginning very much went the Confederacy's way, thanks in no small part to the advantage in military leadership the Confederacy had in these early stages. The Seven Days Campaign in June of 1860 62 proved very uh, successful for the Confederacy. And this led up to the Second Battle of Bull Run, where the Confederates again emerged victorious. And Robert E. Lee tried to take the momentum the Confederacy had in these successful campaigns in the East and invade the North in September of 1862, where Confederate troops entered the state of Maryland. And there the Battle of Antietam took place. And there the Union was actually successful in repelling a Confederate offensive attack. And this battle itself proved to be up until that time, the most deadly battle of the war. 4,000 were dead in a single day, and Lee was forced to retreat. One of the first significant victories for the Union side of the war, especially in that Eastern theater. For the war in the West, Ulysses S. Grant was given command of much of the forces in that Western theater, and he was able to secure some key victories early on, especially in Tennessee and New Orleans. And, however, after these early victories, the momentum stalled, and the Confederate and Union forces reached somewhat of a stalemate in that Western theater in these first few years of the war. That concludes part one of our chapter 14 lecture series. As always, study hard, and we'll see you soon.